So we're going to talk about some other conjunctival problems. We're not going to talk about conjunctivitis. That's a relatively large topic, and I addressed it earlier on. We are going to talk about the pinguecula, the pterygium, and the subconjunctival hemorrhage. And these are all very common things that you're going to see in clinic. So the pinguecula is a type of conjunctival degeneration in the eye, and a lot of times it won't be noted uh, unless it's by you or the patient, and it's only noted uh, visibly because these don't cause any symptoms most of the time. Uh, when you look at a pinguecula, you see a, gross, a grossly yellowish-white deposit in or around the limbus. And what is the limbus? The limbus is that area where you transition from uh, transition from sclera to cornea. So it's right around the periphery of the iris. The majority of pinguecula are asymptomatic, and when they're present and when the patient complains about it, usually what they're complaining about is either, I don't know what this is, or get this off of me, this is ugly. Uh, so this is really only a problem if there's a cosmetic concern, but the pinguecula itself is absolutely harmless and you don't need to do anything with it. But more important than what the pinguecula is and what it means is what the pinguecula stands for. And pinguaculas are directly correlated with UV light exposure. And obviously, being exposed to UV light, having your eyes exposed to UV light, can lead to a lot of other things, such as photokeratitis. So, when a patient has a pinguecula, it's a sign that perhaps they have been not wearing sunglasses outside, they've been getting snow glare, and so forth. So, this is a sign of UV light exposure. Uh, UV light exposure is directly correlated with the risk of developing a pinguecula. That being said, it is most common to get a pinguecula on the medial part of each respective eye, and imagine why that is. You have your nose, your nose reflects the sun, reflects those UV rays, and it reflects it right back into the medial portion of your eye. So the medial part of your eye is really getting the most UV radiation compared to the lateral part of each respective eye. The diagnosis here is clinical. This is a very simple diagnosis. Yellow-white deposit near the limbus. It's a pinguecula. Treatment is just reassurance. This is totally normal. You don't need to worry about this. Patient education. Wear sunglasses if you haven't. That will reduce your risk of getting more in the future. And in very limited cases, the pinguecula can become inflamed and uncomfortable. And if it is uncomfortable, if you have the typical clinical case of pinguecula, but it's uncomfortable, then you can use topical corticosteroid drops. So here's an example of a pinguecula. So right around that, right on that limbus, right on the periphery of the iris. Another one. And another one. So pinguecula comes from Latin pingue, and pingue means fat. Okay, a pterygium is a benign growth of conjunctiva, and typically it extends from the conjunctiva, usually the medial part of the conjunctiva, to the cornea. And it tends to take on a wedged or winged shape. And as a matter of fact, if you think of the dinosaur pterodactyl, pter pterodactyl, where it gets its name from, is wing, because those dinosaurs can fly. And pterygium comes from the same base uh, Greek word. Pteri means wing. So this refers to its winged shape or its wedged shape. This also is associated with excess exposure to UV light, as well as exposure to sand, smoke, wind, and other things. Anything that can really irritate the conjunctiva. The patient may or may not have associated symptoms. If there are symptoms, the symptoms are going to be foreign body sensation, because you really do have a foreign body in, in the presence of uh, unusual tissue uh, developing on the conjunctiva, tearing, dry eyes, and so forth. If the, if the pterygium is large enough to where it crosses into the pupil, then certainly that will alter vision because it's going to distort whatever you're seeing. So we don't want to wait for the pterygium to invade the cornea. 
therefore, we want to treat this as soon as possible. If the pterygium invades the cornea, you can get corneal scarring, and that would be problematic. So we want to treat these ASAP. And the way these are treated, you're going to refer them off to an ophthalmologist. They'll do either irradiation or surgery. Uh, there's other professionals, non-ophthalmologists, who may have experience in this procedure, but this is usually a, a referred procedure that's done by somebody who's got some training in it. So irradiation or surgery. So unlike a pinguecula, a pterygium requires treatment. And the reason is because a pterygium will grow into the cornea and will invade the cornea and also will, uh, it will also cover the pupil and that alters vision. So here's a pterygium. You see you've got conjunctival tissue here. That conjunctival tissue is all the way over passed onto the cornea and actually in front of the pupil. So this is kind of a, a, analogous to a synechiae. Remember a synechiae is where you get the iris tissue attaching to the lens. Here we have conjunctival tissue attaching to the cornea. This is a pterygium, a wing. Here's another one, a little bit more severe. So it looks just like conjunctival tissue, but it's covering up the cornea and parts of the iris and pupil. So this person would probably be blind because it's very difficult to see through all of this conjunctival tissue. And they also have it on both sides. This is called a kissing pterygium, or you're developing it on both sides. Obviously, these patients need to be uh, need to be um, counseled for uh, sunglass use, and uh, you want to get at if there's any possible occupational exposure to dusts or hazards uh, that may be precipitating this. The subconjunctival hemorrhage is painless bleeding beneath this beneath the conjunctiva. So the conjunctiva itself covers many fragile vessels, and those vessels are uh, fragile enough to burst if there's uh, high enough pressure. A subconjunctival hemorrhage is a symptom. It's not a diagnosis. So subconjunctival hemorrhage can be caused from many different things, but it itself is a symptom, not a diagnosis. It's a sign, something that you see when you're doing physical exam. So there's a lot of different causes of subconjunctival hemorrhage, severe coughing. So this may be your patient who has, uh, uh, has COPD. Severe hypertension, a patient on blood thinners, maybe an 80-year-old lady who's taking, uh, who's got her INR up to two, two and a half. She's at risk, uh, not necessarily because these are fragile vessels, but because you can bleed easily. Heavy lifting, straining, constipation, vomiting, all of that we see there. Intra-abdominal pressure just transfers up. Trauma, that would be like rubbing on your eyes too roughly. That can uh, destroy those vessels. This can also be an adverse effect of refractive surgery. In really young children, it can be a sign of vitamin C deficiency, and it can also be a sign of abuse. And then there's also something called acute hemorrhagic conjunctivitis, which is happening with more and more frequency. It's caused either from enterovirus uh, or from Coxsackie virus. So here's a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Note that it stops at the limbus because you, you have a, an abrupt transition of tissue here. This is a closed system, so it stops at the limbus. So you shouldn't have any blood covering up the iris with a subconjunctival hemorrhage. So the symptoms, this is a painless and harmless problem, but it's very easily noted by a patient when they look at their eyes in the morning, ah, oh, my eyes are bleeding. And so these patients usually wind up in the ER or in the urgent care because you see your eye bleeding, if it's never happened before, you're going to be freaking out. So try to put yourself in the, in the shoes of these patients. 
Uh, so this is usually noticed by a concerned patient or a parent if it's a child at home, or it may be noticed by you on a physical or if you're rounding a patient. If the blood is red, you can assume that this was relatively recent, like within the last couple days. Uh, you should ask them about the common causes. So have you been coughing? Have you had any respiratory issues? Have you been doing any heavy lifting? Have you been working out? Have you been vomiting? Have you been constipated? All of those things can cause those uh, causative factors that can lead to subconjunctival hemorrhage. So it's not so much the subconjunctival hemorrhage we're concerned about, it's what possibly caused it. Because some of these things, like vomiting and constipation and severe coughing, those can be things that might lead to another important diagnosis, and the subconjunctival hemorrhage was just a sign. So important to get towards that. But if it was just lifting packages or lifting weights or something of that nature, you can tell them just to take it a little easier. After a few days in the natural course of subconjunctival hemorrhage, as this is a uh, this is a, a uh, limited self-limited disease process. After a few days, the blood will turn greenish or yellowish in color uh, as the hemorrhage remits on its own, and uh, it should be gone completely within about a week or maybe two if it's severe. The diagnosis here is clinical. Like I said, the primary concern is what caused the hemorrhage. Usually it's accidental, but you should go through your list of possible causes of subconjunctival hemorrhages just to make sure, because if a patient comes in with a subconjunctival hemorrhage and they're constipated, and they don't tell you they're constipated, this is a great time to treat them for their constipation, because then they don't have to come in a second time. The treatment is self-monitoring for improvement, so the patient just looks into their eyes and says, is this improving, is this not? If it gets worse, they can come back in, but generally these tend to get better before they would get any worse. Uh, and of course, address any secondary cause. Now is your chance. So uh, on the USMLE, uh, especially step three, or uh, on step two clinical skills, uh, if you have a patient with subconjunctival hemorrhage, uh, you want to look for the secondary cause and then do a workup for that secondary cause uh, and then treat that secondary cause because you want, when a patient is in, you want to Take care of all of them, not just the one thing that they're complaining about. And if you have any questions, go ahead and let me know.